Uh, good morning, everyone. It is my uh, great pleasure to, to introduce uh, doc, Dr. Robert Lucky as this morning's Olgar Distinguished Speaker. Bob is a former executive director of research at Bell Labs and corporate VP of research at Bellcor. Bob is one of the most talented multi-dimensional multi people I have ever met. He is a gifted electrical engineer who has made foundational contributions to communications technologies. His invention of adaptive equalization was key to the development of high-speed data transmission systems. His technical contributions have earned him the Marconi Prize, the IEEE, Edison Medal, and membership in the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a writer par excellence, the author of several books and a widely read column on technology and engineering culture called Reflections, which was published in the IEEE Spectrum. He was an outstanding research manager. Two Nobel Prizes were won by researchers in the communications research division that he managed at Bell Labs. He has served on numerous high level advisory boards for the Department of Defense, the Federal Communications Commission, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, and the exclusive TTI Vanguard Technology Forum. He is also a gifted raconteur who can hold CEOs of companies spellbound. Bob holds a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in electrical engineering from Purdue University. Maybe I shouldn't mention this, but I have played violin duets with Bob. Bob is a much better violinist than I am. Today, Bob is going to tell us about his adventures in biking Europe with Len Kleinrod, one of the founders of the internet, and who I think is also on this Zoom session. So Bob, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Um, all those things that you just cited that I did, they're totally irrelevant this morning. I'm just an old guy on a bike, that's all. Uh, I've given a couple of talks uh, in the past for the old guard and I really enjoyed the interaction with the audience. Young's was always great. And I'm gonna miss that this morning. As you can see, I'm just in my computer room up in my attic and it feels kind of weird not having that interaction. But uh, you all are giving me the opportunity this morning to reminisce about a time in the past when I did fun travel. Uh, today, one of the things I really miss in this pandemic is the ability to travel. And I feel like I can't even dream about it now. But this morning, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I was thinking in this talk about why we did this, Len and I. And I, I recalled an episode in the beginning of Paul Bowles' great book, uh, The Sheltering Sky. Three Americans come to Algeria in 1947. And as they arrive, one of them says, we're probably the first tourists they've had since the war. And one of the others says, we're not tourists, we're travelers. And this is a very interesting distinction between being a tourist and a traveler. Now, Len and I were not tourists. Uh, in fact, uh, and you won't see many tourist type of slides here. This is the experience of a biker. Uh, I was just remembering that when we walked around tourist places, as we did sometimes, Len always wore his biking helmet. And I don't know if he did this deliberately or not. I don't think he did, but I was glad he did because it, it was a symbol that we are not like you guys. We're not tourists. You know, we're riding bikes here. And so it's a totally different uh, kind of uh, thing. Uh, so what I'm going to show you is a bunch of photos that I've chosen to represent uh, the, the joys, the small adventures, misadventures, difficulties of seeing the world from the seat of a bike and uh, seeing, the, seeing the countryside uh, in up close and personal, mile after mile. Uh, but before I get into the, those uh, photos that will demonstrate some of these uh, things about biking. Uh, I'd like to, as a way of introducing my friend Len Kleinrock, uh, who I guess is on this call, so hi Len. Um, I'm going to uh, show you a, a video, as, as uh, Al was saying, uh, about uh, 
Lynn. I, I think there are a number of people on the call who probably know him or at least know of him. Uh, he's a computer science professor at UCLA, he lives in Los Angeles. And he's one of the three or four people credited with inventing the internet. So what I'm going to do is to show you a two and a half minute video of him talking about the beginning of the internet. This is from a documentary film done by Werner Herzog called Lo and Behold. So I'm gonna see two, two and a half minutes of this. Uh, Paul, do I have to initiate screen sharing here or you do that or what? I'm not hearing anything, but I will go ahead and uh, initiate the screen sharing. You can do it. Okay, I got you. Okay. Okay, let me now go to uh, the slides. Let me turn on the full screen here and get this. Uh, okay, uh, just a few uh, facts about the trips before I go into the photos. About a dozen trips in Western Europe and they were about a, a week to 11 days uh, and we averaged about 35 miles a day. Uh, the least day was about, of all the trips was about 25 miles and the most was 60. Uh, most people when they bike in Europe, they take a package tour. All you have to do is show up. You don't have to worry about your bike or meals, uh, even taking your luggage from place to place. But for Len and I, we wanted to have the satisfaction and the sense of accomplishments that comes with doing it all yourself. And it is a lot harder, however. One of the major decisions in doing this kind of thing is whether you take your own bike or rent one there. I actually have done both of these and uh, they both have their pluses and minuses, uh, but I've reached a, a strong conclusion about this and that is they both suck. Uh, we'll get, you'll see some more of that as we go through the, uh, through the photos. Uh, the first trip I took too, I, I did not make advanced reservations. I thought, well, I'll just go over there and bike wherever I feel like it. But the second night I, I arrived in a little market town in England and I'd driven 53 miles and it was, it was dark and I could not find a place to stay for the night. So after that, I said, you know, I'm always gonna have reservations and not worry about where I'm gonna get a hot shower that night. Uh, so we also uh, plotted out the paths before we, get, we went. I take a lot of care and Len and I would spend months emailing back and forth with each other, uh, plotting out and making all the arrangements that we needed to make. Uh, we choose the stopping points about 35 miles apart, uh, small towns, and we look for interesting towns. Uh, we look for back roads. These final three things though are things that we always worried about but couldn't actually do and worry about in advance. Are the roads safe for biking? How bad are the hills? And is this gonna be scenic routes or not? Uh, from the maps that we had then, it was really impossible to find these things out. Even today, Amazon, uh, uh, Google Maps are much better, but it's, uh, it's still very hard to do. And we're always surprised when we get there and find out they're not what we expected. So what could possibly go wrong with all these arrangements that we've made? Well, it rained every trip we, were, we took. We got lost on every trip that we took. There were tough hills on most of the, of the trips that we took. Uh, traffic can, can sometimes be a nightmare. And I, I'll tell you, doing roundabouts on a bike in, in, in the UK is really, could be really nerve wracking. And we had lots of bike and equipment problems. And in the end, biking is dangerous and you can't get away from that. I'm going to start out in Ireland. Uh, it happened to be the first trip I took with Len. And here we are ready to go out on our first, first day of the first trip with Len. It's pouring down rain. We're in Cork in the southwest part of Ireland. We've just rented these bikes, which is another story, but we, I can't give you all the stories. Uh, it's always a moment of trepidation because you're in, uh, you have an un unfriendly bike, and an unfamiliar bike, and one that's unwieldy because you've loaded it with all your equipment. We took all our equipment with us. Uh, and you can see how unwieldy it is because Len was taking his picture of me and his bike has fallen over and the left part over down here. Uh, that's Len's bike and it's so unwieldy, it's just fallen over. And you have to take these bikes through the pouring down rain in the traffic of Cork 
uh, in the morning rush hour, and we have no idea how to get out of the city. Uh, riding up a hill outside the city when we finally did that, it was pouring down rain, it's a four lane highway, busy, there's no shoulder. And uh, somebody rolls down the window as they pass me in the car and they shout out, idiot. And I'm thinking, boy, they are so right. Anyway, we survived, it stopped raining and later in the afternoon, I get a flat tire. Now Lynn gets off his bike and, and the bike starts to fall over again. And he, he stumbles to get to, to, to catch the bike and his uh, dark glasses fall off and there's a crunch as he steps on them accidentally and his designer uh, sunglasses are broken. So I'm, meanwhile, I'm changing the tire and I, I made sure when we got the bikes that we had spare tube and a, and a pump. So I put on uh, the new tube and uh, mounted the back wheel back on the bike. I went to pump it up. And as luck would have it, the pump was it had a Schroeder valve and the tire had a Prester valve. So I could not pump up the bike. Uh, just the little things like that. So I had to ride the last five miles into the town of McCroom where we would spend the night on a, essentially on the rim of my, of my wheel. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time in the trips. This is another thing, it's just uh, another day and I'm eating lunch and uh, I bought a little uh, a Coke and a little, uh, little kind of apple pie from a convenience store. But usually we would eat lunch uh, with the leftovers from breakfast from wherever we'd been uh, the previous um, that morning. Um, and I, in my imagination, I always believed that we would have some great picnic in some beautiful place uh, and or else stop at some really nice little restaurant somewhere. Never happened. Always would end up standing by the side of the road just eating breakfast leftovers. And that's one of the realities that you face. But some of the great moments were at night. This is Killarney. We looked for a great restaurant and we would look for a pub. And when Len and I talk about which trips they, we like the most, Len always said this trip was the best because of the Irish pubs at night and the Irish music that we love to hear. So every night would be like this. The next morning in Killarney, we went past uh, Ross Castle. Since we're not tourists, we didn't go inside. But I was told that there was a path that went out of Killarney that you could ride on a bike that would take you out without going through traffic. So we went on this path. It was like something from the medieval days, a horse-drawn carriages, castle in the, in the, in, in the distance. Uh, beautiful, one of the idyllic things. But it was not so idyllic, actually, because it was pouring down rain, and all those horse-drawn carriages that left manure all over it. And as we rode the bikes through, it just got splashed all over everything. So not so good after all. Just the little things that you, you would happen to us. We were riding, it was Sunday and this day, and we're in the middle of nowhere. And there's this little store that seemed to be open and we needed to get some food or drink. And so uh, Len had stopped there and I thought he just stopped to fix his bike up a little bit. But in fact, it was a little store and it was actually a post office. And there was a woman who had to be about a hundred years old running it. And she had one little shelf of food to sell, just tiny little things. I bought a dusty can of Coke just to be buying something. And afterwards we were talking about, was this pathetic or was it really great that this old woman was able to do this thing and interact with people? Uh, it's just a little memory events that you, you come by. Okay, we're lost. This happened every trip all the time. You think, how can you get lost? You have GPSs and I always loaded the trip itinerary onto the GPS, all the roads and everything. And it never worked, never. And we always got lost. You say, how can you get lost with GPS and the map? Well, the GPS on the bike's only about an inch square. So you can't see where you are. And even the map, if you don't know the road you're on, and these are unmarked, un unmarked back roads, you can't find, you don't know where you are in the map. So it was a regular occurrence. And here we are trying to figure out where we're going. But there were moments of serene beauty. Uh, this is Bally Bunyan in the early morning, a gorgeous day. And says, hey, it's great to be alive. Here we are. And then the nights, we both fell in love with this singer at this pub. Just wonderful music. Uh, 
something over at uh, Town of Lahinch uh, an overnight, beautiful, almost like a film setting, and it was great. And one memorable thing about this small town was that when we found the, the one pub in, in town, and they had open mic night where anybody could get up and sing. And uh, so people came from all around the local area to try their hand at singing. And it was really, it, it was just, just really nice. I remember a waif-like young girl singing Fields of Gold. Uh, that was really nice. But then there was a, a man that had a terrible voice that started singing American Pie. And between the terrible singing and the length of that song, we left. So here we are at uh, the Cliffs of Mower. Uh, this is a tourist place, uh, but we see it as here as a biker. I had to pump up the hill to get here and I'm covered with sweat. And this is my, I made it photo. Biking through the burn. It's interesting because I was going to say about this photo that this is boring and a lot of the times it is boring. But I looked at my contemporary notes for this and I said, in those notes, this is beautiful. So I saw it as beautiful, so it must have been. And along the way, we ran into someone who we thought was a gypsy, which is called a tinker in, in Ireland and his little family. Uh, maybe it was just a tourist thing or something, I don't know, but, but we thought it was a tinker. The best part of every trip was dinner. Uh, here we would celebrate ourselves with wine. We say, hey, we got through a number, another day. We survived, we're here, this is great. And the sense of accomplishment it's sort of like après ski, you know, you, you survived a day and, and there's something very joyful about that. Uh, on the road to Galway, toward the end, uh, I'm scrunched up against the, the rock wall here as these big cows lumber by me and, and sort of push against me. And I, I'm not a cow person, so it was a little scary for me. Uh, around this area, we were talking to a farmer there. And uh, I asked him, uh, I said to him, you live in a beautiful place. And he said, it's not beautiful when you live here every day. So that's enough for the Ireland. I'm going to go to a trip in England. Um, we rent bikes uh, in downtown London uh, on the south bank of the Thames, Gabriel's Wharf. And uh, we, we're going to take one of the national cycle paths in England, the, uh, the Thames River uh, Valley Path. Uh, but here we are in downtown London at rush hour, and we need to get to where that path starts, which is Putney Bridge. So we ride these bikes to Waterloo Station, and that was, uh, that's a, tra a challenge. If you're on an unfamiliar bike riding on the wrong side of the street in London traffic, uh, and trying to get to a train station where everybody else is going. And I remember trying to carry the bike up the escalators at the station. Oh, what a nightmare. I was afraid I'd, I'd, I'd lose, lose the grip of the bike and it would crash down the thing, killing people in behind me. But, and Len bought the tickets and was told that his bill was no good, that the 20 pound note that he was using had expired. And we never heard of that happening before, but I guess it happens. So we get to Putney Bridge anyway, and we're ready to start our trip, and we're trying to mount the last things on our bikes. And Len is trying to mount the handlebar uh, bag on his bike. Now, the handlebar bikes, uh, bags we always use to carry our uh, things that we couldn't get stolen. Uh, so, so we always carried them with the, us when we walked around. So Len is uh, trying to uh, mount this bike, uh, this bag on the front of his handlebars. And he drops a screw that holds the thing onto the pavement here, and it bounces and goes through the railing and down to the sand along the Thames. So he's down there pawing through the sand trying to find a screw, and it's taking a while. And I'm, say, I'm thinking, Len, we've got to go. It's going to get dark. We've got miles to go before we get to our hotel. So finally, Len gives up, and he comes back, and he sort of jury rigs the bag. And throughout this whole trip, the bag was falling off and Len was working on new ways to try to attach this bag to his front. Finally, he gave up and used a bungee cord to, to connect it to the back of his bike. But that was just a recurring thing. We did get there. The next morning is one of those beautiful mornings that 
you think that this is what biking's all about. This is beautiful. About, uh, it's a nice bike path along the Thames River in the early morning. It was at this point actually that I biked ahead of Len, uh, which is rare because Len's a better biker than me and he would always uh, be in front. And in fact, when we went up hills, Len would always wait for me at the top. I should say, I'm really not a very good biker. So, uh, and I know that there are probably people on this call that are much better than I am. Uh, but uh, I did it. I bike a lot actually regularly around here, but uh, I, not strenuous biking because there are no hills here where I live in uh, the Jersey Shore. So anyways, I was ahead of Len here and uh, I didn't see him and I thought he'd surely catch up. So I went back and I found him at the bottom of this uh, little slope. And he had skidded at the bottom, cut his finger and hurt his ankle. But Len always carried a medical kit with him and, and uh, quite a few times uh, needed it. Uh, so he got patched up and he's a real trooper and wasn't, wasn't a problem as we went ahead. So we're following this bike path and um, we bought maps for this, uh, for this bike path on the internet, but they turned out to be totally useless. So uh, we were at the mercy of signs and, and obviously these paths are not on the regular paper maps that you have either. Uh, you can, of course, get the ordnance survey maps, but uh, they only good for five miles and you have to buy scores of them to get through your whole trip. So we didn't, we didn't actually have them usually. So anyway, uh, we're at the mercy of the signs for this path and the signs were sometimes missing, far apart or sometimes even wrong. And we're going along, we have no idea whether we're, we're going right or not. We go up the hill and uh, this is Lynn the chain has fallen off his rental bike. And this happened regularly. Um, it's one, of, one of the problems with uh, rental bikes is, frankly, they were usually awful. Uh, we're lost, but we find ourselves in Great Windsor Park at the top. And we can see the Windsor, Windsor off in the distance here. And at least now we know the direction we're going. Later in the day, though, in the afternoon, here's a, uh, one of the signs for this bike path. And the signs are uh, like crows and they're, they're black iron signs. And this is, sign is pointing at the path goes off into these weeds. I, and I'm sitting there, what the heck are we supposed to do? We're not biking through these weeds and stuff. There's nothing out there. So we end up going on this walking path out, out here on the right. And we are totally lost for an hour or so. Uh, we find a little town and Len stops to get his chain fixed. And we wait a half hour or so and he pays to get it fixed. But later on, it comes off quite a few more times. So it wasn't very good. Here's a morning leaving Reading, uh, going to Oxford and it's pouring down rain. Now, as I said, it rained at least some of the time on every trip we were on. And I always thought that uh, when I bike around here where I am, uh, near Red Bank uh, that uh, I would never bike in the rain. That just sounds like an awful thing. But when you're on a bike trip like this, you have to. You have to get to that next hotel. And so if it's pouring down rain, if it's really stormy, you still got to go. But it's not quite as bad as I always imagined because if you're really dressed for it, and we, we always carried really good uh, bi uh, biking clothes for rain, it's not all that bad. Certainly not as good as a sunny day, but it's not that bad. Now, when we got near Oxford, uh, I, had, I had this great coup where I found out a, a path that went along the river and, and let you avoid all the traffic going to Oxford. So this was a real find. But when I got there, when we got there and we got into it, it turned out not to be so good after all. And so here we are, we're a bit, we're a ways in. So we're past the point of no return. We can't go back, but going forward, this is pouring down rain and all of these weeds and stuff around are, are totally wet. And we're thinking we need a machete to get through here. So by the time we get to Oxford, we're dripping with mud and wet and it's been miserable. And I remember walking into the hotel lobby, dripping mud and, and, and water on their, on their lobby and so forth. So anyway, uh, we did get to London and to, to Oxford, excuse me. And, uh, had a very nice dinner there. The next day we're following a uh, canal along the path in the canal. And this is a canal that's plied by what they call narrow boats. And here we run across a, uh, a boat that was carrying a, a bunch of young girls uh, who were a wedding party. 
and they were just having a glorious time. They had just lost the key to the lock. The key's a lock. The lock. The key is a big iron wrench that you use to work the lock in the in the canal. And they've dropped it in the water, and they think this is just hilarious <laughs> that that they've done this. Um, this is what a lot of biking is is all about. There's land way out in there, and and just fields, infinite fields of corn or whatever, and. Uh, it, it has a kind of a serene beauty about it in a sense. And, but that's what a lot of it is like. And uh, it's good, they're good memories, but they're big hills too. And they're not on the map sometimes. This was a long hill. And you can see I am really exhausted at the top of this thing. A dinner in Danbury, in Bamber, Banbury, like the Banbury Cross. Um, and the reason I'm putting this in, I mean, this is a dinner we especially remember, but it was pouring down rain in this town of Danbury. And uh, we're trying to find a restaurant. And Len, Len has this thing where he always asks directions of people. I never ask directions. So it's good that Len does. So anyway, Len was going to ask someone for advice about where a good restaurant would be. And there's some guy huddled in a, in a doorway in the rain, and he looks, he looks to be a homeless person. And Len's going to go ask him about a restaurant. And I'm saying, no, no, Len, don't do that. Don't do that. So he goes up and he asks this guy to recommend a good restaurant. And the guy looks at him blankly and says, I live here, but I don't do restaurants. Uh, anyway, we love this dinner, spaghetti. And, and uh, Len said afterwards, we needed carbs. So we're biking on this path. And I, I have to tell you right now that it, it was incredible that we, in the week and a half that we spent on this national cycle path, we never saw another biker. So I think we were the only way. And lots of times we had no idea. Why are we, we don't know where we are and why are we going through here? Here we're going through a farmer's field and there are cows and stuff there that we had to push to open a gate to get in. And sometimes we were biking through people's backyards and stuff and that seemed to be where we were being directed, but we had no idea. Uh, I should say I remember too in that setting that I just showed you that we ran across a, a, an older couple walking in their finery. It was a nice sight, like something out of Downton Abbey. Uh, and we talked to them for a few minutes and they said, where are you biking from? And we, we said, London. And they looked at us kind of blankly and they said, good show. Anyway, this is Stratford on Avon and this is my I made it photo. Uh, it's always a joy. I got where we were supposed to go and, and there we are. Uh, out on the road outside, uh, Len is the, the, he's having bike problems again, but also he's got burrs all over his, uh, all his socks. And that's the one thing that happened. And also we had several times that we got stinging nettles. Stinging nettles with your bare legs on the bike, you're brushing against weeds on the side of the road. And it really uh, burns your leg for a couple of days. And in Ireland, uh, Len went to a drugstore to try to buy some uh, lotion that would help this. And he picked out some lotion. He went to the to the cash register, and the girl there, I looked at him, and she said, um, "This won't work, but we'll sell it to you anyway." And how could you resist resist a, a sales pitch like that? So he bought it, and she was right; it didn't work. We're in the town of Tewkesbury, small town, and we asked the uh, proprietor at our B and B, "You know, what is there to see in this little town?" Um, and uh, the man said, oh, well, you have to see the Abbey. So we went to see Tewkesbury Abbey, which is, I find out now, is supposed to be the second most important Abbey after Westminster in, in uh, England. Um, but it was a memorable night because as we were walking through here, they were starting a service. And uh, someone said, well, if you like, you can stand in the back and see some of this. So we stood in the back. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm not going to stand here very long because, you know, I'm not too interested. I'm a biker. I'm not, you know, attending church services. And there was no, uh, there was no choir or anything. But then a choir started to walk down the aisle, and they started doing the most magnificent music I have ever heard in a, in a church. And the next morning at breakfast, you know, I was saying, how is it that a small town like that this had such a magnificent choir? And the proprietor there said to us, well, you're having breakfast with some of the singers. And so we started talking to them. They said, oh, that isn't a local choir. So we come from all over England to this special event. So that was really a memorable night. Here's Len, the, the chain has fallen off his bike again. Uh, 
even though he paid to have it fixed. So enough for England right now, and I'm gonna go to France. Uh, one of the, the first trip we took in France was to Brittany and Normandy, and we started out uh, in uh, the town of Dinan in Brittany, a uh, town on the coast there, beautiful picturesque town. And we arranged to have bikes delivered to our hotel there. Uh, and uh, they were good bikes and we were uh, here ready to start out from our hotel on our, on our, our great adventure for that day. And the first night we were in the town of St. Malo. And it's a beautiful town on the, on the sea there, a walled town, we're walking on the wall. Uh, by the way, this is a setting for a magnificent book, uh, a bestseller and about six years ago, uh, All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr. It won a Pulitzer Prize. It's about a, a young a French girl who's blind and so she can't see light. And a young German boy during the occupation there who uh, is fascinated by radio and feels that he can see radio waves, but he really can't. So both of, neither of them can see the light that they wanted. Nice book. So we're trying to find uh, Saint, uh, Saint, Saint, uh, Saint Michel, uh, and we're lost. And incredibly, we run into a, a road sign in the middle of nowhere, and we are lost. So I'm looking at the sign, but the sign doesn't tell you anywhere where you are. So I had no idea. So we gave up on that. But as we bike uh, aimlessly, suddenly we see in the distance, rising out of the mist, Mont Saint Michel. And this is my favorite biking pic picture ever. It's a gorgeous, pristine morning. We have this, this little lonely road by ourselves and the distance in the distance is one of the great tourist attractions in the world. Just a beautiful thing. Well, we're there and we're watching for this uh, momentous tide to come in and the loudspeaker is blasting out in every different language to beware, danger, don't be out there because this tide is coming. And the tide was a no-show this day, never even showed up. So anyway, what a dinner setting there we had that night, just a beautiful thing. Uh, we're biking north up the peninsula toward the invasion beaches of Normandy. And uh, we're in a hotel in Granville, and this is my room. And the reason I'm showing it to you, our hotel is perched on top of a sheer cliff. And in fact, in all of our trips, this is the first time that Lynn had to push a bike up the hill. I mean, he never did that. I had to do it quite a few times, steep hills and so forth, but this was like straight up to get to our hotel. And also I was changing clothes and this, all of a sudden I see some guy hanging out there in the middle of, of the cliff looking in at me. This is so weird, I was shocked. And it, what it was was one of the hang gliders that were, were going on by there. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the Count, Count of Granville has a, a boardwalk, a small boardwalk down there, and I think the next picture shows you all you need to know about that boardwalk. Just a really fun place for tourists. Okay, we're lost again. We're trying to get to uh, the Normandy coast up there, and this is a typical kind of thing. Which road do we take? And Len and I would, Len would say we should go right, and I would say we should go left. And Len was usually right, because he had a much better sense of direction than I did, but whatever it was, he, he was right. So we got to the invasion beaches. I hadn't been there before and uh, I, I didn't anticipate it as much as I should have, but when I got there, it was very, very moving. I'm sure many of you have been there, but it is a very, very moving thing. And we went to the American Sanitary, of course, and here I recreate the walk from the opening of uh, Saving Private Ryan, when the old, the old guy walks up here, and now I'm the old guy walking up there. And uh, the, the crosses are certainly moving there. Uh, this is a town of, uh, of um, let me think, uh, Kabur. Kabur, yeah. And uh, the tide is just out, and the horses are galloping along the, along the, the beach there. It's a beautiful, beautiful sight that you sometimes see. And near there, we crossed the Greenwich Meridian, uh, zero longitude. And I checked on my bike GPS and sure enough, all zeros. I said, hey, this is kind of neat, going from east to west, west to east actually here. Anyway, we end that trip uh, in the town of Honfleur and it's a favorite spot for uh, the Impressionist paintings, a beautiful picturesque setting. 
And the next morning then we, we ended the trip and we were gonna take a train back to Paris from Montfleur. Uh, and this is another failure of planning. I, we had a lot of failure of planning. Uh, there is no train station in, in Montfleur where you can go back to, to Paris. So we actually had to take a bus back 30 miles away we had come in order to find a town where we could actually get a train. Anyway, that's enough for that trip. And I'm gonna talk about another trip in France, uh, in Southwest France, uh, in, um, uh, in falling along the river Dordogne, the Dordogne River. And here we are in the town of Saint-Emilion Saint uh, in the Southwest corner of France. And we've arranged to get these bikes uh, taken to, in, uh, uh, to the hotel where we were staying. And that night we found the bikes, sure enough, they had been delivered to our hotel and they were locked to a post up on the hill on top that you're looking at right now. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't know the combination to get them unlocked. Uh, but after some telephone calls uh, to uh, the person responsible for uh, getting the bikes there, uh, we got them unlocked. And I picked out one of the bikes uh, arbitrarily and I started to wheel it down this little hill and Len got the other one, but it couldn't wheel down the, down the hill. The back wheel wouldn't turn. And uh, it was so out of true, so bent that it wouldn't go through the, the brake at all. So at breakfast, uh, Len called the, the proprietor, the person responsible for delivering these, who was in Paris or someplace like that. And, uh, and he said, well, the only thing you can do is to take the calipers off from the brake and, uh, and ride to a, a nearby town that he named where you could get the bike fixed. The wheel fixed. So we took, we, we, we opened the brake completely on a lens back, back wheel. And as we went out, the wheel is wobbling back and forth wildly, and there's no brake in the back. And uh, we got to the next town where they had a very good bike uh, store where lens wheel was going to be fixed. And here we are, we're really happy they're going to fix the wheel. And uh, we go outside, walk around the little town a little bit. We come back and uh, Len's bike is off the uh, stand there, and they said, uh, we're getting it fixed. We've ordered a new wheel, and it'll be here in a week. Uh, so, so we're off, and Len's biking with no back, no back brake, and, and the, the wheel wobbling back and forth. So we get that night to the town of Bergerac, and we go to another bike store, and we give it the bike to there to be fixed, and the, and the proprietor takes it back in the back of the, and they're working on it, for a while and finally comes out and he says, La Rue est morte. And now the wheel is dead. So for this entire trip, Len went without a back, without a back brake and a wobbling tire. He's a real trooper, okay, it was great. So uh, this is one of the serene moments of beauty, biking along the river Dordogne, which is off on the right below us here, early morning, uh, road to ourselves, pristine morning air, uh, just this is what it's all about. You remember these times, uh, uh, wasn't all like that, but, uh, but a lot of it was. Uh, so here we are at uh, Les Z, which is uh, wh the, where the prehistoric cliff uh, people were. And this is near the famous cave Grand Rock. And we went up there, but it was closed for the day. But the, the, these caves were inhabited by in the prehistoric times. And there's also a museum of prehistory there that we actually did go to. We usually didn't do tourist things like museums, but we did go to that one. So we're headed now through duck country. And I, there were duck farms all along. And all through this area of France, duck is the big thing. It's the big food, food stuff, and everything's based on duck. Not a good place if you're a duck, though, I don't think. Uh, Another day, we went to the famous cave Lascaux, where the famous cave paintings are. We had advanced reservations there. And this is at the top of a long hill. Actually, it rises 720 feet in elevation. And we had tickets for exactly 11 o'clock. They only let a, a small group at a time. And uh, I had a hard time pumping up that hill. And I always remember, as I pumped up that hill toward this cave, uh, I was passed by a bunch of bikers from one of the biking tour. And they were being pulled by their sag wagon, a long rope. And as they went by me, they looked solemnly straight forward. And I thought, son of a gun, 
you guys got it easy. Uh, anyway, in the cave, uh, by the way, as many of you know, this isn't the real cave. The real cave is right next door to it, but the real cave has been sealed and they recreated this Lascaux II cave exactly uh, three-dimensionally correct within a millimeter of the, the cave. So it, it is a authentic real experience right in the same location, but it isn't actually the real cave. Anyway, the, the cave paintings are there. They're 17,000 years old. And um, the, the amazing thing is that in pictures like this, or when you actually see it there, I mean, it looks this way. It looks like a two-dimensional painting on a canvas. But when the, the guide uh, shines his flashlight across this, you see that it's painted on a very lumpy, rocky surface. And the cave painters have made it look like it's a flat surface. So, I mean, it is an amazing thing. And when they illuminated it that way, there was an audible gasp from the small, small group. Anyway, um, this is a group, uh, this is the town of, of uh, Salat. And we knew nothing about it. It's funny because Len and I, we both carried uh, travel guides, books, but we never looked at them. And we were always surprised when we got to a town, there's something about it. We didn't know what to expect. And Sarlat happens to be one of the um, most preserved uh, medieval towns in Europe. And it was really beautiful. We ran into some other bikers. Uh, I forget where they're from, but they were from the US. And uh, there was a the father with his two sons, one of which is shown here in the picture. We ran into them three times on this trip. They were doing the same thing as us, biking it on their own and, and choosing their own itinerary. But uh, uh, it, was, it was very pleasant. And at that night, we had this outdoor restaurant in a beautiful setting. And we, we started talking to these people here. And they were chocolatiers, chocolate makers from uh, Seattle. And they were here to uh, pay homage to the setting of the movie Chocolat. Uh, with Judy Dench and uh, I forget the uh, the other woman, but the, they they run a chocolate shop in a place very near here, on on the river. So, uh, just one of those little passing things you find. Uh, on another day, a raconteur. It's a fairy tale setting, but you have to see it as a biker. First place, pumping up all the hills to get up to the top here, and then you plunge down. Our hotel is on the bottom down here. And you plunge down here, and halfway down, you go through a, a pitch dark tunnel. In the bright sunlight, you suddenly plunged into total blindness. It's scary as all get out. And Len was talking about it afterwards, too. I mean, he was really going fast when he went into it. And I don't know what would happen if someone was coming up in a car through it at, at that time. It was really scary. And then after you've done that, the next day, you got to pump back up and out of here. Actually, we come up and through here and out that way. Uh, but it is it, it was worth it. It was a fairy tale town. So enough of that. Let's go to uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I a couple of trips there, and I did one uh, before I met up with uh, Len, or before I started biking with Len. Uh, and uh, they're missing a, a, a one here. Uh, this is a Schiphol Airport, and I bought my own bike. Uh, and I had boxed it up and the picture that somehow I missed uh, for whatever reason just now, uh, it showed me with my bike in a box at Schiphol Airport. Now, the thing about this airport, it's the only airport that I know where you could actually bike out of the airport. I mean, can you imagine trying to bike out of Newark Airport? You'd be killed before you got anywhere. Uh, but, but at this bike in the Netherlands, uh, at this at this bike path in the Netherlands, you immediately plunged into the uh, countryside uh, of that country, right at the terminal itself. Uh, I actually assembled my bike just sitting in the terminal there in the airport, and this is one of the biggest airports in Europe. Uh, just sitting in there, and as the people walked by me, putting my bike back together, changing clothes there in the airport, and then heading out, uh, biking south along the. Uh, along a national bike path, LF1, uh, with uh, the uh, sea on my right and the dikes as, we went, as I went along uh, south here. Now, this was a failure in planning in these early, early days. 
I always thought that biking in, in the Netherlands would be really easy because it's flat and I, I love flat stuff. Um, don't get much of it in most of our trips, but here it's possible, but they got a lot of windmills. And there's a reason there are a lot of windmills is that they have a lot of wind. And along the, the, the seashore here, there's a tremendous wind from the south, prevailing from the south. And all along this trip down south to Belgium, uh, it was really brutal winds. Every now and then, in fact, pretty pretty seldom actually, you find a little bike, a little bike uh, bistro or something on, uh, and, you, and I have morning coffee, and this is it's great to relax with something like this. Uh, Delft, wonderful town. I've been there a number of times, and uh, uh, always think of Vermeer, uh, the paintings, it's a beautiful place. Anyway, uh, this is the uh, Delta project where they, they uh, have a, a, a monstrous project to, to mechani mechanize the protection of the country from the sea. And uh, uh, it's rated by Michelin a three-star uh, tourist attractions, but on a bike, boy, it's like negative three stars because I'm going the wrong direction into the wind. And the, the wind is like a hurricane here. And in fact, while I bike along here, the wind is partly from the right here. And, and it's very, very strong uh, coming across like this. And as I would go one of these stanchions here, all, I'd be leaning much this way into the wind to try to stay upright. And then I would suddenly pass where a blockage of the wind and all of a sudden I'd be thrown off to the left. And it, like it went on forever. Oh, geez, that was awful. Anyway, get to Belgium and I'm, I'm in the rain as usual, following a canal toward Bruges. Uh, spent a couple of days in Bruges, actually. It's just a beautiful place. I'm sure many of you have been there, and uh, one of the great uh, preserved towns of, of Europe. And I had a very special uh, night there. Just by accident, they were doing a televised production in the main square, and uh, they had uh, they were doing mostly uh, Broadway show tunes and dances and so forth. Uh, but I and, but I particularly remember. They, uh, they sang uh, Edelweiss in Flemish, of course, and the audience was swaying back and forth, and it was just a magical moment that I always remember. Um, now I'm, I'm biking toward Ghent, and uh, in Ghent, uh, another very nice town in uh, Belgium, of course, and I'm headed toward Antwerp the next day. And Antwerp, you have to go across a big river to get there, and there's a bridge that uh, it's a big highway bridge and it's the only one and as i approach the bridge i have i'm really worried about how i'm going to get across that bridge because i don't see a way that you can bike across that bridge but as i as i get near i see bikers in front of me and they're disappearing off of the off of the road I said, where are they going and i discovered that there's a tunnel for bikes underneath the river to antwerp and so you can actually bike under the river <laughs> or walk with your with your bike, which is really kind of neat. Anyway, enough of that trip. Uh, quite a few years later, I, I this is the last trip that I, I took with Len, or the last trip I've taken in Europe, actually. Um, so it's fairly contemporary. We rented bikes in, in downtown Amsterdam, and uh, we got, uh, we took two hours to try to get the bike set up. They had to give me a different bike twice. They, Bikes didn't work, they changed the wheels, everything. So we finally got out to it and, and we wanted to start out. We're going west toward Hilversum and south. And uh, but we don't we don't know how to get there. We're we're immediately lost. And in fact, the, we're we're where we were at the bike store, we were uh, there was a one-way road to the east, and we don't want to go that direction, but that's a one-way road and we didn't. You can ride the wrong way in, in Holland, but in a busy street like this with a lot of traffic going the wrong way, just didn't seem like a thing. So we were immediately lost. And here we are, we're, we're lost. And also we're finding out bad things about our bikes. For one thing, this is my bike, and I find that it has 24 gears, but only one of them works. Uh, and now Holland, that's not a big deal. Anywhere else, it would have been terrible. And we sure didn't want to go back to that bike store. We couldn't find it. I mean, we don't even know where we are right now. And the problem is we've got paper maps and we've got GPSs here. 
But the GPS is a tiny thing, and it's just a rabbit warren of, of streets that are unnamed or anything. We don't see the name of the street anywhere. Uh, and Len's having trouble with his bike, too. So uh, it's, and we just can't go back, so we have to go make the best of it. So we're biking randomly. Now, I have no idea what this building is, but this is a typical Dutch scene. Infinity of bikes. Uh, and I don't know how you can even find your own bike. Uh, really incredible. So we get to Hilversum, and the next morning we want to bike out of. We're up here somewhere in, in Hilversum, and we want to bike. Uh, we want to bike toward uh, Utrecht, uh, near where we're going to spend the next night on this M4150 that goes out to the southwest. Uh, and this is the, the 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 recorded route on my GPS that we actually used. And we went down here and we got to this point and the road was closed and the police wouldn't let us through. So we gave it another shot. We went around, we couldn't get through. We thought, well, let's try another way. And we went around here, we went out there, you don't get anywhere. And we get around. To, so about an hour and a half later, we're back where we started and we're going out around here and circling and we just can't get out of this town. So finally, we just go out a direction we, we didn't want to go and we're going here south. Well, eventually we get there. Uh, now, here's a great failing of planning again. This is uh, the hotel we stayed in that, uh, the next night. And uh, so, and what we, where we wanted to go, we wanted to go to Gouda. And Gouda is at this little uh, road here on the left, the lower left. Uh, and it's a little country roads to get there. But, but we are blocked by super highways. We're, we're just blocked where we are. Uh, this was one of the big problems about biking in the Netherlands. I mean, there are bike paths everywhere and it's bike friendly everywhere, but uh, you get blocked occasionally by, by super highways and you can't get through on bikes. And so you, sometimes we had to go around miles to get to get to find a place where we could get through. But here on this morning, uh, we're going to have to go many miles to get back to around and through and around over both of these back to this little road. So. We, what we do is really stupid. We decide we're going to carry our bikes and stuff across all these lanes of rush hour traffic. And we stop traffic and people are honking at us and we have to lift our bikes over the center divider. And, uh, but we do it. I mean, it's crazy. You get killed doing this, but we did it. Not a good memory. But the dessert is we got to this beautiful idyllic road in the early morning. And this is again what biking is all about. And we even find a little cafe here for morning coffee. And uh, this, and as we bike along, this is your, your idyllic uh, uh, Netherlands scene. Two boys in a robot boat, uh, uh, windmill in the background. Here's a young girl fishing from her apartment window in the canal. Uh, in the town of Gouda, by the way, they don't pronounce it Gouda. And when we asked directions, so people didn't know what we were talking about. They, they pronounce it with a very raspy H. Uh, so, and you'll notice something about this that we couldn't get over and we talked about it a lot, is that nobody in the Netherlands, nobody wears a helmet, nobody, only Len and I, we religiously wore our helmets everywhere, but they don't. Here are two twins, nice picture. Gouda was a neat place, we stayed there the night. The next day we're in Leiden uh, for the night, and Leiden, a, a bike infested place, beautiful canal town. We go to the university there, because uh, it's one of the famous old universities, and Len was going to go and, and show his uh, UCLA credentials and so forth. But when we got there, it just wasn't very picturesque. Uh, but we saw these co-eds out there. And don't they look like girls out of Ramirez pictures? I mean, typical, uh, uh, I shouldn't say, but they, they do like somehow you imagine that girls in Holland would look like. A little bit about the biking in Holland. For one thing, you, you do get a number of places where you have special uh, Stop lights and push buttons for bikes. And uh, this is a town of Nordbike on the coast. I have great memories of an information theory symposium there many years ago and so forth. Uh, biking, uh, then, um, uh, and again, this bike path that I used many years ago, LF1, but this time north and uh, going back toward uh, Harlem and, and, uh, and then Amsterdam. Uh, there's something neat about being on a bike path uh, and just being out of all traffic and having this beautiful flat expanse to go through. But 
The fact is, after a while, it gets boring. And I'm thinking, I could be in New Jersey. Uh, what is, why am I in Holland doing this bike path? So, and you don't go through any little towns that are picturesque, anything like that. So there are pluses and minuses of, of bike paths. There are a lot of signs. Of, any red sign, road sign is for bikes. And you get a lot of those, it's kind of neat. Well, all right, so much for the Netherlands and stuff, but I'm approaching the end here. Uh, Danube path is the easiest path of all. Uh, it, it's, so if you want to do an easy path in Europe, the Danube is it. It's 230 miles from Passau in Germany to Vienna in Austria. You can rent bikes one way and turn them in on the other side. Uh, there, uh, it's very picturesque. It's slightly boring because it, the scenery doesn't change all that much. Uh, here, there's one main attraction that was really good tourist place, and that's the Abbey at Milk, up at the, the monastery, I should say. And we can see it on a hill up ahead. And we didn't know anything about it because we don't read the guidebooks or anything. But we got there, we were overwhelmed at how beautiful this was. The library there, but there were, every room was unique and distinctive. And we could see at the top, the Danube where we'd been, and there's the place where we'd come through. Now, uh, we're in uh, the town of uh, Spitz. And uh, we were told that there was a castle there. And if we came up this fairly steep hill, we'd see the castle. So we went up there and the castle was nondescript. We, was, I think we ran into this other biker there. But that's all uh, neither here nor there. The thing is, what happened now? Len got back on his bike and rode down this hill and then started back on the, pike, on the path uh, that we were taking to the to the uh, east. Uh, I got back on my bike and I started down and I made a left turn at the bottom of the hill and, and went a ways. And I went a ways and I went a ways and I thought, well, Len must be waiting up there for me. And I went out of town and I still hadn't seen Len. And then I started to worry, where's Len? And I was thinking maybe I should go back, but what if I go back and he's in front of me and I didn't know what to do. So all this day I biked by myself and we never planned on this and we didn't know what to do. It was only by accident because that I knew where we were headed that day because Len had the vouchers for the hotels. And it just happened that I knew, remembered this one, but most, yeah, I wouldn't have. So I get to this hotel where we were gonna spend the night and Len's not there. And I, I, and I worried, really worried about him for quite a while, but he turns up a half hour or so later and he has actually biked 13 miles longer than I did because he asked people for directions as he usually did, and I never did. And they told him this bridge was out. So we went back quite a ways and around. I never asked anybody and the bridge wasn't out at all. Anyway, so I was really happy to see him. Great. And we talked about at dinner, what should we have done? And we never arrived at what is the algorithm they should have. I had, my phone did not work in, uh, in, in Austria. Uh, his did, uh, but we never figured it out. Len did the right thing. He went back to where he last had seen me at the top of that hill. I didn't do that. I, you know, it, it would have been going back a long way for me. And I had no uh, idea or confidence that he would be there when I got there. But we finally did get to Vienna. Just a few things about Italy. Uh, and then I, I'll be through. Uh, we, we were at a meeting in Barcelona. We took a plane to Milan. Uh, we took a train from Milan to Verona, and then we changed trains to go to Bolzano in the foothills of the Alps of the north. And uh, here I am in, at the train station of Verona, and the trains are in strike. We can't go anywhere. <laughs> oh, we did get there. And the next morning, another fiasco. We had four bikes delivered by two different companies by accident. I, I won't go into how this happened, but we chose the best ones. And actually, there were two people there that represented the country. Fortunately, the company, the company, the best ones. And we called the other company and, and they were really mad at us because they delivered these bikes, but the bikes weren't the ones we wanted and they weren't even outfitted as we requested. But so there was a lot of back and forth acrimony on the, on the thing. But anyway, we start out from Bolzana, following the river Adige, which goes most of the way to Venice where we went in. And we biked along this river. And again, it looks idyllic, but after a few hours, it was anything but. The wind was in our face, it was brutally hot, uh, and uh, it was kind of boring for a while. We ran into a, a cafe right there. We're the only people there, but boy, I was so glad to get something to drink. 
a little later in the afternoon, we noticed that the, I noticed that the river was going the wrong direction. I said, Len, something's wrong. This river is, fall, is flowing up and it was flowing down. And sure enough, we find we've been biking the wrong direction. And I don't know how we get turned around. Actually, when I got back to New Jersey, I could see by the recorded track on my, on my GPS how we did it, but it was one of those things. We were biking the wrong direction. In Verona, we run into somebody, a, a friend who was there for a performance of, of Aida at the, at the Coliseum there. Uh, he said the next day, actually, when we saw him, that, uh, that he left in the middle of it because the acoustics were so bad he couldn't hear the singing. But anyway, we did one tourist thing there. We went to the uh, Juliet's, uh, from Romeo and Juliet's, uh, Juliet's uh, balcony there. Everybody does that. So you have to do that when you're in Verona. Uh, one final thing, and I'm through. Uh, at the end of a long day, we reached a, a hill on the top, Vicenza. Vicenza is the bottom of this hill. And here's land at the top of this, uh, this hill. And, and the town of Vicenza is down. And all we have to do is coast down a fairly steep hill to uh, Vicenza. Uh, Len starts out in front of me. And when I get down the bottom of the hill, I see that Len has crashed and he's unconscious in, in the middle of the road and there's blood all around. Uh, Len ends up in the hospital. And one picture, here he is a couple of days later in the hospital with some unknown roommates. But you can see he's a real trooper. He broke his shoulder and some other things, but uh, he survived. And uh, we actually went on another bike trip a couple of years later. So. Len is a real trooper. I'm proud of him in many ways. I'm proud of him for how he, uh, for all the things he's done for us in the in the in in our profession, but also what, uh, how for all these bike rides. So thanks a lot, Len. And that concludes my talk. And uh, I guess it's kind of hard to ask questions for a talk like this, but if you'd like to give any comments or observations, I'll be glad to hand to, to hear them now. So let me stop the sharing and uh, turn the mic over back to Paul Tippi or whoever, uh, Mitch, whoever's going to do this. Well, I actually got my hand up first. I put it up at the beginning of your talk. What a, what a delightful tour and multiple tours. I, it, it just took me back. I actually did a week long bike trip in the Cotswolds in England. when I was a graduate student over in London and it's such a wonderful experience. And I just regret that I, unlike you, I didn't keep doing it the rest of my life. Uh -huh. So it, it's just it's so, so delightful. I just wanted to make one quick comment on uh, Len's observation about the first word being transmitted over the internet and how prophetic it was. There's another aspect to that that occurred to me, how prophetic that was. And that was that in the middle of the first message being transmitted on the internet, the internet crashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could do that these days. Uh, there, there are a lot of people that predicted that uh, crashes of the internet had, had not been come true. Well, in that uh, case, it was the entire internet was down. <laughs> like Bob Metcalf uh, famously predicted that it was going to, the whole thing was going to crash. And he had to actually end up eating his words physically uh, at a meeting. He actually <laughs> okay. chopped, chopped up the paper and, and, and ate it. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Tittle. Oh. You can unmute. Okay, uh, Bob, thank you very much. A, a fascinating talk. So I have a tough question for you because um, I'm 76 years old. I, I feel like I'm in good shape. I feel like I can bike, but I don't know. How old were you, if you don't mind my asking, when you packed it in for a trip like this? Yeah, uh, so the last trip was in uh, 2012 and uh, eight years ago, I would have been 70, 70, 77, 76. Yeah, all right, okay. Uh, well, age. But you know, there's some, and, and I did all these trips then at that age, but, I, but you know, in the Daniel trip, we ran uh, into several times a family with a, an 80 some year old grandmother that was doing that trip. So uh, anybody can do that trip. I mean, there are trips you can do, but I, I wouldn't do trips like uh, I think the hilliest one was the one to Dordeaux in the southwest France. That would that was a tough trip, but there are uh, Cotswolds actually is very tough too. We did do Cotswolds, but that is that's a tough trip. That very hilly region. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Alan Chenoweth. Oh, hello, Bob. Um, really enjoyed your talk, and um, uh, the, the, I was struck by so many. Um, 
uh, points in common there that um, uh, I was amazed at the places you've been to and uh, were familiar to me I'm in England and I'm in Normandy and even in Dordogne. I, I remember having um, in my teenage years spending a, a fortnight on a on a vineyard in Sala, just um, on off the hill outside Sala, and um, uh, from that um, base explored quite a bit of the Dordogne area, including places like Rocamadour and Les Zizi and so on, and um, uh, it was just amazing. But I was also struck by um, your comments that uh, it nearly always rains and. Um, and that took me back to my high school years um, when um, we had to cycle to school um, a few miles um, uh, come rain or shine every day. Um, the, no other way of um, getting to school. Um, the cycle was our most precious belonging in those days. And, um, and um, uh, we had to get there. I can remember even cycling on icy roads and in the snow and um, uh, pouring rain. And uh, as you found in um, Holland, um, how um, often the wind is such a, a trial. So uh, very enjoyable talk, Bob. And there were so many um, nostal um, uh, moments of nostalgia for me in listening to it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, that's good. And I remember when you were young, that you actually followed trucks. You winded them or something. You would you, you'd get in the wind tunnel behind them and be pulled. Uh, so uh, I thought, oh, I, yeah. I, I never yeah. did that. You also I've done did that. I, I used to um, have my bicycle in, um, in London University when I was at London University and would sometimes cycle out into the country from there. And um, I visited a friend about 40 miles outside London. Um, up the Thames Valley, um, I'd take the Great West Road out of um, out of London to get up to um, Marlow and Henley. That was where he lived on the Thames, and um, and um, I remember how I used to just uh, uh, trucks. Well, lorries were um, uh, uh, regulated at um, thirty miles per hour, and um, uh, with my lightweight sports bike, I was able to keep up uh, with the. Uh, using them as the windbreak. And it was just wonderful to do that trail the lorries. Yeah, I should say too, that you use the correct uh, French pronunciation of Salon. Uh, I, <laughs> there's a T on the end. I thought this morning for Americans, I should, if they want to know what town it actually is, if there's a T on the end. Yeah. yeah I, I noted um, you were having um, a meal at a restaurant, Le Bouffon. Um, uh, and I made a note of that. I'm going to look it up on the, um, GPS on the uh, Google Maps and see if I um, know exactly that spot in Sala. But, the, but that was back in 1949 when I was there. Oh, okay. The world was different then, yeah. Thanks, Alan. Well, Walt Meissner is next. Uh, hi. Uh, very nice talk. I'm a biker myself, but I haven't gone to Europe. I have uh, one comment, maybe two or three questions. Uh, you know, when I went from a three speed to a 10 speed, the 10 speeds don't have fenders on them. And if, you know, going through the rain, uh, bikers wind up to get a wet stripe down their back because of it. And I, I bought a, a plastic fender, which is lightweight for a 10 speed I had, but I noticed only one <laughs> of your bikes had that. So that was only a comment. The other question I have, uh, it seems like you rented most of your bike, but did you ever bring a bike uh, your own bikes. And uh, the other question I have is, uh, did you did you or Len uh, n could speak any of the languages in the countries you were in? Uh, I found Italy was most problematic because I couldn't run into anybody that spoke English. And it was a good, I, I knew a few words. And the other question is, if you needed money on your trips, did you use traveler's checks or some other means how did you plan that aspect of it? Because I ran into a problem in more recent years. I went to six banks before I could finally found somebody that would cash traveler's checks. So that was a real problem for me. Okay, let me ask some of them, answer some of them. First, uh, uh, we uh, never used traveler's checks. Uh, I took my own bike twice 
and these are tips before I, I got uh, together with Lynn on the on the tips. Uh, and the the problem with taking your own the, the logistics of taking your own bike are really difficult, and particularly coming back, how you box it up again, where you find a box, how you get, and and getting from the airport to any place where you can bike and with your bike and all your stuff. It's it's the logistics are very hard. But I did it twice. And the advantage is that you've got a good bike that you're familiar with. And the problem though with renting bikes are two big problems. And one is the bikes are terrible. We had so much trouble with them. And uh, uh, and the other the other big big problem, again, it's logistics ones. Often you have to go back to the place where you rented them to return the bike. And in one of our trips there in, in England, uh, we had to take an 80 mile cab ride to return our bikes out to downtown London. And uh, that was just to get to a train station where we could get to London. Uh, and for that 80 mile trip, first it was very expensive, but the expense was nothing compared with the, the tedium of having to listen to the exp explanation of cricket from the cabbie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bob Martin, you're next. Hey, Bob. Hi, Bob. Bye. I really loved your talk. It was great. Oh, thank you. Thank but you. But scared the, you scared the hell out of me, and I don't think I scared anybody. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, 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 good. You should be. The, uh, by the way, that was just, just delightful, as always. Um, a internet question, of course, um, and maybe for Lynn as well, if he's still on. Uh, did you have a eureka moment? when you realize that the internet wasn't just for, you know, nerds like you, me, yeah. Alan, Lynn. You know, was there something you saw somebody do where you went, it's here? You know, uh, actually, uh, no, I didn't. But the thing was, I sort of almost resented it becoming a, a, a thing for someone else. I thought it was just for us techies, you know, and I wasn't sure I was ready to share it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, is Linda up there? Are you there, Linda? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, hi. Good to see you guys. Hey, there you Bob, are. That, that was an amazing talk. Oh, and I don't, I'm sure the rest of the uh, listeners observed how detailed you were. You remembered every town, every road, every sign, every event, every crash. <laughs> an amazing memory and the ability to recreate things that I totally have forgotten about. Great companion, an enchanting trip. But to answer your question, uh, it, there was never a, an, an aha moment. The most significant one was when email in 1972 took over the traffic of the internet. Because nobody understood it was going to be about people talking to people as opposed to machines talking to machines. But there was no you know, critical point when we said, ah, this is really what it's about. It just grew on us slowly. Nerds playing around and it happened. Yeah, yeah. Bob, that was a great talk and very well represented. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, one more hand up, Ed Atkin. Uh, if anybody else wants to ask a question, raise your hand now. We're almost at the end. Uh, Ed Atkin. Ed Atkin, um, I can't seem to unmute you. Move uh, along. I'm, I'm not getting an unmute button for you, Ed Atkin. So Le Jim, uh, Jim Landwer, we'll move on to you. Hi, thanks. That was very interesting. Uh, I took a, a bicycle trip through uh, Europe the summer between my, uh, when I, after I graduated from college and, and started graduate school, totally different situations and so on. But one unexpected problem I had was spokes breaking in the Netherlands and Belgium with all those cobblestone roads. And uh, I don't, I want, and once you have a couple spokes broken on a wheel, you're pretty well done. Uh, and I wondered if you had that type of a problem or if uh, the technology improved enough so you didn't. I, I don't remember, but uh, Len actually got impaled by a spoke in, in our trip along the Danube. You remember that, Len? <laughs> <laughs> got stabbed by the thing for crying out loud. Okay, so Ivan Jacobs next. 
I've been have how about you using have you can did you consider using a little motorbike instead of a pedal bike? <laughs> oh, that's cheating. I know. <laughs> you know, the, the, the electric bikes are getting very popular now. All the bike stores are sort of featuring them. But, uh, you know, I bike now for exercise. Uh, so, uh, I, and that would be terribly cheating. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand the mic back to Al Ahok. Um, Bob. Um, Thank you so much for a superb, captivating talk on biking through Europe with Len. Um, I suspect that for all of us who have been sheltering at home for a year without going anywhere, this was a much needed therapy of being able to travel, uh, at least virtually. So um, uh, not only that, but uh, your stories of what can happen on bike trips, uh, I can relate to a number of them. But um, um, as you may remember, the old guard has um, two ways of thanking the speakers. Um, uh, can we um, get our certificate of appreciation? You can uh, probably add this to your collection of many certificates of appreciation, but um, you may remember that the old guard was founded in 1930 in Summit and at that time, the summit was the orchid capital of the East. So uh, the old guard has been using the summit as an emblem on its certificate of appreciation. And the um, second way the old guard has of thanking its uh, speakers is with a gold, uh, with an old fashioned old guard salute. So if I can ask everyone to move. And Wonderful. So Bob. Thank you again. My pleasure.